Good evening. Et bonsoir. I'm Catherine Spencer Ross, President of Heritage Ottawa and Chair of our Lecture Series Committee. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our Emerging Scholars Lecture. Each year, we devote our October lecture to highlighting the research undertaken by students, usually from our local universities or colleges, which offers a fresh perspective on Ottawa's heritage. During this event, four scholars and two of their professors, Peter Kaufman and Michael Windover, will recount stories of Carleton Place through the town's architecture. Jennifer Irwin, curator of the Carleton Place and Beckwith Heritage Museum, will share some thoughts with us and will be introduced to a new online virtual museum of architecture. Our Q&A session this evening will be hosted by Anne Mayhew, an art conservator, member of our lecture series committee, and a former Heritage Ottawa board member. Anne will come on after the presentation and will moderate the questions and then close our event. Our lecture series is made possible through the generosity of our sponsor, Andrix Holdings Inc. and Sandy Smallwood. Andrix has been a faithful sponsor of these free lectures, as well as of our walks and some publications. We're also grateful for an operations grant from the City of Ottawa and a heritage grant from the province of Ontario. I'd also like to thank those of you who have made a donation to Heritage Ottawa and encourage this very concrete form of support. I invite you to join Heritage Ottawa if you're not yet a member and to make a financial contribution to the organization. Please visit our website for information. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Peter Kaufman, who in turn will introduce the rest of the participants in this evening's presentation. Peter is a supervisor of Carleton University's History and Theory of Architecture program and an associate professor in Carleton's School for Studies in Art and Culture. He has degrees from the University of Toronto, the institution formerly known as Ryerson University, York University, and Queen's University. A specialist in medieval and medievalist architecture, he has written numerous scholarly articles in journals and edited volumes, and is the author of the book, Newfoundland Gothic. You may remember that early in the pandemic, Peter presented one of our first online lectures on Canadian Gothic. If you were fortunate enough to see it, it would be no surprise to you that during the pandemic lockdown, Carleton University presented Peter with an award for excellence in online learning. He has also written several journalistic pieces and made many media appearances to discuss issues connected to architecture and heritage. He served two terms as president of the Society for the Study of Architecture in Canada and currently sits on its journal's editorial board. His current research focuses on the issue of architecture as a point of contact between settler and indigenous cultures in the 19th century. Peter has a diverse background and eclectic interests. A photographer in a previous professional life, he continues to exhibit and publishes images. Recent photographic projects have included Andrew Waldron's architectural guidebook, Exploring the Capital, the book Camino, which he also wrote, and Lorna Crozier's book of poetry, The House the Spirit Builds. He is also a valued member of the Heritage Ottawa Lecture Series Committee. And with that, Peter, I will turn the mic over to you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thanks for that introduction. And, and thanks to all of Heritage Ottawa for, uh, for inviting us out here. I'm delighted to be here taking part in this event today. And thank you most of all to our audience. Uh, um, I, I guess three years ago, I would have said, thank you for coming out on such a dismal, cold, damp night. But the world we live in now, I'll say, thank you for staying home on a dismal, cold, miserable night. So we're here tonight, as you know, to, uh, to, to launch a project that we call VMAO. VMAO is the acronym for, for the Virtual Museum of Architecture in Ottawa, and it's a project we've been working on at Carleton for a couple of years now. What VMAO is, is a collection of online exhibits about architecture in the Ottawa area that are entirely created by student projects. The students are, are in our History and Theory of Architecture program. They've been working on this in courses for the last couple of years, and tonight we're going to launch the first sort of beta version of a very long-term project that I hope will really have legs and go on for many years to come and just keep getting bigger and better. I should explain what History and Theory of Architecture is, or HTA as we call it. It's a program, an, an undergraduate program at Carleton University in which we study the, the history and the meanings and manifestations of the whole built environment. 
We, we look at how it is shaped by human conditions and how it in turn shapes human experience. And our students in HTA go on to careers in sometimes architecture, sometimes planning, sometimes in the heritage profession, whatever specific profession they may go on to, one of our overarching goals in the HTA program is to produce graduates who can become constructive participants in public conversations about architecture. As I'm sure you know, those conversations are, I think, going to become more and more common and more and more important in the years to come as heritage conservation, climate change, housing crisis, all these issues are making our conversations about architecture and the built environment more and more urgent. And one of our goals is to produce people who can participate in those conversations in a productive, constructive way with a broad public. And so having our students work on a virtual museum, something that would actually be able to reach an audience that goes way beyond the university walls seemed like a, an ideal way to achieve this goal. So this, what we're launching tonight is the pilot project in VMAO. And you may think, well, it's the Virtual Museum of Architecture in Ottawa. Why are, why are we doing starting with Carleton Place? And I'll confess it was completely serendipitous. It wasn't originally part of the plan. And uh, full disclosure, at the risk of possibly offending some of uh, our audience who may be in Carleton Place. For the first decade that I lived in Ottawa, I didn't actually know anything about Carleton Place at all. I know I knew it was there, but to be quite frank to me, all, the only image Carleton Place conjured to me was uh, two intersecting highways and a, and a gas station on one corner. And I was completely ignorant of what was in there until one day my wife and I needed to go into the town to meet with somebody uh, that, that had, we'd corresponded with. And so we wandered into town and discovered that it's really an absolutely extraordinary place. I was absolutely blown away by the quantity and quality of heritage buildings there. It's got a lovely historic downtown core with heritage buildings that actually we, we think of heritage as sort of 100, 150 year old stuff. And that's there. But heritage going right into the 1960s with the library and that sort of thing. It's just got a wonderful collection of architecture spanning many decades across the last century and a half or, or, or more, in fact. So having been so taken with this heritage architecture in this place I'd never really visited before, we went to the museum, the Heritage and Beckwith, rather Carleton Place and Beckwith Heritage Museum. And by chance, the curator, Jennifer Irwin, was there. And I started talking with Jennifer about how wonderful I thought her architecture was. Unsurprisingly, she completely agreed. And in fact, it held that view for much longer than I had. And we talked for a while longer. And next thing you know, we had a collaborative project to work on. And so the museum has been our partner in this VMAO, this first phase of the VMAO project. And they have a wonderful collection of artifacts, of course, if you've ever visited it. They also have a wonderful uh, collection of primary documents, which would give our students a chance to work with primary documents. Of course, they also have access to everything that's already been written by other historians about Carleton Place and the architecture of Carl Carleton Place. So we quickly realized that this would give our chance, or our students rather, a chance to work with some wonderful buildings, some primary documents with other historians, and work for a real life audience, thanks to our partnership with uh, with the museum. So now I'm actually going to call upon uh, Jennifer Irwin herself, who has joined us tonight, and uh, will say a few words about the project from her point of view. Over to you, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm Jennifer Irwin. I'm the curator of the museum here in Carleton Place and a great lover of architecture. Um, I am so excited by this project and the finished exhibit. Of course, I've always known that Carleton Place is full of many interesting and unique buildings. And when I met Peter at the museum and I saw his enthusiasm, um, it, was, it was a reminder and it was catching and it was wonderful. So his idea of creating a virtual museum of buildings was something I, I dreamed of. It's a way to share our town's history with everyone, no matter where they are and is something that will complement our existing self-guiding walking tours and our exhibits. So choosing which buildings to include wasn't easy. Uh, we needed to have enough information about their use, um, their construction, ideally who lived and worked in that building for the students to work with. So we gave the students a variety of places to choose from that included industrial, residential, 
uh, municipal buildings. And while I would have liked the students to have been able to visit the town more often to walk the streets, go into the buildings, meet the shop owners, um, dig, physically dig into our archives here at the museum, this project did take place during COVID. We had to be, <clears throat> excuse me, we had to be creative in getting our information to the students virtually. We were able to share photos and videos of each building chosen as well as any photos of related artifacts in our collection, things that came from that building or were used um, in the building. The project gave us a good reason to digitize more of our archival collection and in doing so make them easily accessible to the students. So thanks to this project, we now have, we now have just over 60% of our archival documents all scanned and digitized and a large quantity of pre-1930 local newspapers have been digitized as well. So the exhibits the students have created, they're wonderful little glimpses into the story of our buildings. They bring them to life, um, and in doing so, they bring the history of Carlton Place and of the people who lived and worked in those buildings to life. They've done a fabulous job. I looked over these several times and I'm and, and smiling away, and I love them each time. I can't wait to share this uh, exhibit with, with everyone, our members, our, uh, our general public. And I do look forward to working with the history and theory of architecture students in the future because there's a lot more buildings to look at and a lot more stories to tell. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for that. And thank you also again for, for your partnership in this and for everything you've done for, for our students and our project and, and our program for that matter. It's been such a treat working for you and I'll look forward to, to doing so again. Uh, now we're going to turn to the real meat of tonight's presentation and that is our student speakers. We're presenting, we have four students presenting tonight. So we'll give you these four snapshots from the student projects that are all in VMAO. Everything they're presenting tonight is material that is in the virtual museum and you'll be able to check it out yourself afterwards. And I think these four presentation presentations will give you some sense of the kind of, of range and, and texture that, that we're aiming for with this museum project. All four of our, our students are very recent grads, some from last year, some from last year, or rather some from last year and some from the year before. And uh, all, all of them worked on these projects in the context of a fourth year seminar that I co-taught with Michael Windover, who will, uh, who will be the last of our speakers tonight. So our first presenter will be Ashley Mowry, who graduated from HTA uh, about a year and a half ago. And as you will see shortly, it is thanks to Ashley's content that the term blue blood appears in our, uh, in our evening title. So Ashley, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Peter. So uh, my project is entitled The Carlton Place Roundhouse and the Rural Tour of 1901. Um, this project is centered around themes of Canadian nationalism through um, the infrastructure of the Canadian railway system and its links to royal tours. Um, by looking at the history of the Carlton Place Roundhouse. So Carlton Place, Ontario is home to two important railway infrastructures. In 1872, the Canada Central Railway constructed a station known as Carlton Junction, which is the building you see on the left, along with a large stone roundhouse, which is the image that you see on the right. So a roundhouse is a circular or semi-circular shaped building that's used by railways for servicing, repairing, or even storing locomotives. So at the time, Canada Central Railway was the Brockville and Ottawa Railway Company, um, and it serviced Brockville, Smith Falls, and Almont. And then in 1881, uh, the Canada Central Railway was taken over by the Canadian Pacific Railway. Um, so Carlton Junction became the point of connection between rail lines from Montreal and Toronto, and it also included a main line that ran westwards to British Columbia. Um, both Carlton Junction and the Roundhouse are part of a larger architectural railway tradition that expands throughout Canada and throughout various railway companies. So today, this is what the Roundhouse looks like. Um, it's now home to the Canadian Cooperative Wool Growers. And so the Canadian Cooperative Wool Growers grades and markets approximately 3 million pounds of wool each year. And so the wool is received directly from farmers, from mostly from Quebec, Ontario, and Alberta. And so it links the roundhouse once again to the rest of Canada. So this building um, is the architectural backdrop for the narrative of my exhibition. 
The story I'd like to focus on as part of this presentation was prompted by the image that you see here. So the image shows the old Carlton Place train station known as Carlton Junction. On a flagpole, we can see the Union Jack flying and flag banners decorating the building. Along the sidewalks and wooden fences, we can see people dressed in their finest attires. And it looks like, you know, they're waiting for an important train to stop by. Um, so it's clear that something important is about to take place here, but the only clue that we have to the story being told lies written in white along the bottom that says, our welcome to the Duke. So in 1901, the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall and York, who later became King George V and Queen Mary, visited Canada as part of a worldwide tour to inaugurate Australia as part of the Commonwealth. So while it's not known by many, Carlton Place, um, Carlton Junction, and the Roundhouse had a role in making this tour a success. So their Royal Highnesses and the rest of the Royal Party spend most of their Canadian tour aboard this train that was specifically made by the Canadian Pacific Railway for this tour. Um, so on Tuesday, September 24th, 1901, the Royal Train departed Ottawa, but then its next stop wasn't until Thursday, September 26th in Winnipeg. Um, so like I mentioned previously, when the Canadian Pacific Railway took over the Canada Central Railways, Carlton Junction became a point of connection, which meant that the Royal Train would have to pass through Carlton Place and then leave towards the um, main railway going towards British Columbia to be able to make it um, to Winnipeg two days later. So while it's not officially part of this tour program, um, it was inevitable that they were going to pass through Carlton Place. So as a result, um, the residents of Carlton Place decided to give their Royal Highnesses a welcoming they wouldn't soon forget. The Carlton Place mayor even said that Carlton Place isn't going to be able to give the Duke a garden party or a harvest home luncheon or anything of the kind, but the citizens are just going to make that portion of the town through which he passes look so enchanting that the whole royal party will be disappointed at not being able to stay there a week instead of only 30 minutes. So according to the events that followed, it would appear as though the school was met. Approximately 3,000 people gathered around Carlton Junction and the Roundhouse, which is the building that you see in the top left of that image. Um, to welcome the Duke and Duchess. So around 2 p.m., the Royal Train arrived and anxious to get a glimpse at the guests of honor, the crowd cheered in excitement and waved their little flags while the train rolled up. Um, you know, they sang the national anthem, Maple Leaf Forever, Soldiers of the Queen, and etc. So as part of their brief visit in Carlton Place, the Duke and Duchess shook hands with the mayor and chatted to some of the town members, um, just talking about Carlton Place, its size and its industries. And after expressing their delight to the large and enthusiastic gathering, the train rolled away amidst a sea of cheer and crowds, uh, cheers and applause. And so while the entire visit of the Royal Party only lasted less than an hour, it forever cemented Carlton Place as part of a global history. Um, so the remainder of the exhibit includes a more comprehensive look at Carlton Place, um, at the Carlton Place Roundhouse and its relationship to a larger Canadian architectural railway tradition. Um, there's also a second part of this exhibit that um, charts the Royal Tour throughout Canada, so it includes more information about the Royal Train and even includes interactive timelines and maps that you can scroll through to follow the tour um, throughout Canada. So thank you so much for your time and your attention. Thank you for that. I, I just love that story. And I have to say, if, uh, I've seen, you know, what I think of as the wool shop in Carlton Place. And it's not even immediately apparent that it was once a major piece of Carlton Place public infrastructure, much less the, the, that it was once the backdrop for uh, this grand event in a royal tour. So that's a, quite a, an extraordinary piece of Carlton, Carlton Place's history that's encapsulated on that site. And of course, that's part of Carlton Place's history too, the big stuff, the big public infrastructure, the grand buildings, dukes and duchesses, that sort of thing. But architectural history spans a much wider range than that. In a way, you could say that uh, architectural history is like a, it's like a huge symphony and every single building, big and small, brings uh, an instrument to this symphony. And so our next presentation is going to look at a much smaller in instrument and 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 a, a much more modest piece of architecture but it adds another layer to the textured understanding we want to have of the history of this place so our next speaker is lauren maloney 
and she is going to transport us from uh, a royal retinue to a prominent family home. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Peter. So um, today I'm going to be talking to you about the High Street residence um, built at 207 High Street in Carlton Place. Uh, so I decided to research a private family home because I was looking at, um, you know, as a, an architectural history student, I, we researched a lot of, you know, grand cathedrals and big castles and really impressive grand buildings. And I was interested in seeing what a private, um, more humble, even though this is still a, a big and beautiful home, a more humble structure could tell us about um, the history of a town and the lives of the people that called this place home. Uh, so today we're gonna be talking about uh, what this private residence can tell us about the changing social class um, and gender and how that uh, changed with uh, the changing times in domestic space. So to start, uh, some of the physical elements of this house, including hints of Queen Anne revival style, the large scale, and uh, the location on a large suburban plot in a nice area of town. Um, it positions this home within uh, the Canadian domestic uh, architectural history that reflects growing wealth in Canadian cities and smaller and smaller towns like Carlton Place. Um, and this home has uh, rich connections to the history of Carlton Place. Um, former former Car Carlton Place mayor Wendy LeBlanc has childhood memories of exploring the barn that used to be behind the home and finding old toys, postcards, and photos uh, from the Galbraith and Findlay families that lived in the home until the 1980s. And we're going to be talking about some of those um, people in those families today. So 207 High Street was uh, built in 1902 by a member of the Findlay family, who you can see here all dressed up in their fine clothing uh, at a Christmas gathering. Um, and the Findlay family were prominent figures in the industrial growth of Carlton Place. Um, they founded and managed uh, the Findlay Limited, Findlay's Limited Foundry, uh, which was known for making um, ovens. Uh, and the foundry was a driving force behind the industrial development and economic growth of the town. Uh, the Findlay family was also influential in community politics with two members of the family uh, serving as Carlton Place mayors. Um, and with the success of the Findlay family, uh, 207 High Street serves as an excellent example of uh, what suburban domestic architecture for upper, upper class families in growing Canadian towns uh, looked like. So after being built by a member of the Findlay family, uh, the Galbraith family lived here uh, in the home from 1906 to 1929. Um, the father of the family, Robert Galbraith, was the son of a Scottish immigrant who was successful in Lanark County politics. Um, he lived there with his wife, Mary Elizabeth, and they had two children, uh, Jean Isabel Galbraith and Daniel Murray Galbraith, who you can see uh, when they were younger in one of these photos. And then in the other photo, you can see uh, Daniel in uniform um, as he fought as a fighter pilot in the First World War um, and was awarded multiple times for his service. So the history of the Galbraith family in this home um, doesn't end with, with this family and continues on as Jean Isabel calls this place home uh, for most of her life when she marries George Findlay, a member of the family who built this home. Um, and he's a grandson of the founder of Findlay's Limited. So they got married and moved into the home uh, and the couple raised two children there uh, and spent uh, their entire lives in this home. And George is an important figure in the Findlay family and Carlton Place history. And here you can see him circled in red um, as, a, as a younger man uh, in the Christmas uh, family photo. So the Findlay family have even more connections to High Street that, that demonstrate their status in Carlton Place. Um, you can see here the red brick home. This was built uh, on a lot by where the original Findlay foundry was. Um, so there's a lot of history for the Findlay family um, on this street. Uh, and this is on High Street. And then the other house you can see here is a little bit of a grander example of a Queen Anne revival style. Um, it's a little bit bigger than 207 High Street. And this house was lived in by one of George Findlay's cousins. So again, some more examples of uh, 
of a more decorative residence displaying the wealth and status of the Findlay family in Carlton Place. Uh, and the foundry was very successful. Uh, a Carlton Place Herald article describes Findlay's Limited as constantly enlarging their premises and as a source for a large sum of annual wages in Carlton Place. Um, they were constantly expanding and often uh, were successful while other industries such as sawmills struggled. Um, and this is a period of time that Jean Isabel and George were living in 207 High Street. So they found a lot of success while calling this place home. Uh, Finley Limited was run as a family business. You can see here on the cover of a magazine, uh, George, as the vice president of marketing, was being interviewed um, for the Monetary Times, and he went on to be the president of marketing. Uh, so he, we could say, he probably had uh, a hand in creating this advertisement here for Finley's Limited Ovens, um, showing how the products were often marketed towards housewives, emphasizing the modern progress and the increasing ease of housework. Um, and modern developments in home appliances, such as Finley's Limited Ovens, had a big impact on the demands of housewives and domestic workers. And we can imagine that 207 High Street um, had the best Finley Limited ovens available. So I'll leave you today with this photo of Jean Isabel uh, Galbraith Finley, which is my favorite photo from the prod project. Um, this image shows Jean Isabel playing billiards at 207 High Street. Uh, the billiards room is a space traditionally for men to gather in the home. And this photo provides an interesting opportunity to consider how some of the boundaries and realities of domestic space um, were changing um, in this period of time that Jean Isabel called 207 High Street home. Uh, and all of this you can you can read about in more detail in the exhibition. Um, and that's it for me. So thank you everyone for being here and for listening. And I will pass it back to Peter. Thank you very much for that, Lauren. Uh, one of many things that really intrigues me about that presentation is it shows us how the, the history of a building is such a fluid, evolving thing. We tend to think of a building as something that's fixed, that's sort of uh, timeless in a sense and sits there through different eras and, and provides a constant. But in fact, any building that's been around a long period of time has changed. The biography of a of an old building is as rich and textured and complex and variable as the biography of an old person. And Lauren's presentation shows us that. And the third and fourth presentations we're gonna to have tonight illustrate that as well. The subject of our final two presentations is actually a single building now known as the Grand Hotel in Carleton Place. And we're going to be given two chapters of the long and very colorful book of its history tonight. It's very much a, a sort of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde story. And I'm going to call on uh, Kyle Kreutner first to give us the, the Dr. Jekyll side of the history of the Grand Hotel. So over to you, Kyle. Thank you for your introduction, Peter. All right, so um, yeah, my research uh, investigated the Grand Hotel on Bridge Street. Um, this is formerly known as the Mississippi Hotel. Um, there we go. Uh, founded in 1872, uh, the hotel was built as a luxury stopping point along the Canadian Pacific Railway between Toronto and Ottawa. Um, over the years, the hotel experienced numerous uses, uh, renovations, a major fire. It came close to demolition in the 1990s, um, but today it's been restored. Um, the hotel is built of limestone. Um, it has three stories and features ornamental stonework around the roof and the corners and the windows. Uh, it seems to have two front doors, and this suggests that the building may have been expanded at some point. Um, it also has two doors on the second floor, you can see, uh, showing where guests once stepped out onto a wraparound porch. Um, when I started work on this project, uh, I could see clearly that somebody wanted this building to be special. Um, after examining old photographs of it, I could also see that the hotel had lost some of its most prominent features. Um, as well as the porch, the building had once had a fourth floor contained within a prominent French style roof called the Mansard roof. Um, but these were lost in a fire in 1959. Um, so, you know, who built this place and why did they build it the way that they did? Well, the features clearly belong to the French Second Empire style, 
Um, this was a style that was at the cutting edge of fashion when the hotel was built in 1872. Um, the resources to build it needed to have come from somewhere or from someone, and that someone I discovered was Napoleon Lavallee. Lavallee was an extraordinary person. He was a clever, well-traveled early Canadian entrepreneur. Um, he was born in Quebec in 1802 and grew up poor and uneducated in an immigrant family. He left home at 14 and got a job transporting goods across country by dog sled. Um, later, Lavalley trained to become a cooper, and he used these skills to travel as far south as New Orleans and back again. Um, when he returned, Lavalley found his way to the newly incorporated village of Carlton Place in 1830, where he served the community as a cooper for many, many years. Um, he quickly became a fixture of Carlton Place, and he gained a reputation for telling entertaining stories about his many travels. In 1846, Lavalley became the proprietor of a small inn called the Carlton House Hotel, which is at the top of the street there, and began to grow his fortune investing in the limestone industry. Around 1852, Napoleon and his wife Sarah went traveling through America and Australia. And after his return, Napoleon constructed a very large new hotel named after the nearby Mississippi River. The hotel thrived on the business that it received from the railroad between Toronto and Ottawa, which had been run through Carlton Place in 1857. Um, it utilized the latest technologies, the most fashionable styles, um, all things Lava the Lavallees had seen while traveling abroad. Um, this included French ornamentation, more comfortable rooms, uh, and possibly the first iteration of the hotel's two-story porch. Um, after its completion, it became one of the finest hotels in the Ottawa Valley. And when Lavallee retired in 1883, he was the modern equivalent of a millionaire. Um, yeah, this, it's a rags to riches story. Um, and it's one that you might never suspect. It's one that's seemingly concealed behind the hotel's comparatively simple facade. Um, it shows how even the most unassuming buildings can surprise you and how much fascinating history lies embedded in our everyday surroundings. Um, but this wasn't all for this hotel. In the 1890s, the Mississippi Hotel was expanded by its subsequent owner, Walter McKilquam. He gave the Mississippi a fourth floor, 60 guest rooms, grand new public rooms, and advertised technological conveniences to draw and accommodate his guests. Um, under the McKilquam's management, the Mississippi Hotel experienced a kind of golden age, really. Um, during the expansion, a new central foyer and front door were added to the building, and this is why it appears to have two front doors today. It also boasted a shuttle service um, coming from the train station. Um, it had showrooms for local merchants. It had, quote, hot water distributors, unquote, and an automatic cigar lighter in its cards room. Um, it's a narrative of industrial growth and prosperity that was not unique in Canada during this time. Um, but Carlton Place and the Mississippi Hotel seem to have stood out in the Ottawa Valley as exemplary of the kinds of success that could be achieved in a very short time. Um, each building has a story, sometimes the story of someone's life or sometimes the story of something bigger. The Mississippi Hotel, as it turned out, had both. The hotel may have been the culmination of Lavalley and McKilcombe's life's work, but the hotel's relationship with the town was just as close as its relationship with its owners. It would ultimately operate not only as a, as a successful commercial venue, um, but also as a social center for the town. Locals would eat and socialize and shop there, and local organizations and conventions would gather there. Um, even town council meetings were held in its public rooms until 1883, despite a brand new town hall having been erected in 1870. Um, in physical terms, the hotel, it really connected with the town. The Beckwith limestone that it was built of constituted a really thriving industry for the area, a really important thing. And the railroad for which it was constructed continued to provide customers and goods for local businesses for many years to come. In the end, the research into the Mississippi Hotel ended up being it was a rewarding adventure. It yielded many interesting stories that highlighted the importance of a landmark that really deserves more recognition in Carlton Place. What's important about projects like these is the lives they uncover and the stories that they bring to light and the abilities that those stories have to bring communities together. Um, by emphasizing the long close relationship that Carlton Place has had with the Mississippi Hotel, it reminds us of the value of our history, how we got to where we are today and what we can do to ensure a better tomorrow. The hotel 
has many more stories to tell and not all of them are wholesome as Peter pointed out. Um, it has stories about its larger role in the community, about its role in influencing local architecture, um, a potentially important place it has in the national architectural narrative, um, and also about its participation in the evolution of hotel culture and technology. But if you want to learn more about these, you'll have to visit the Virtual Museum of Architecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kyle. Uh, I just love that story of Carlton Place and how the Gilded Age comes to Carlton Place. But as both Kyle and I alluded to, uh, uh, the history of, a, of an old building is a complex and varied thing. And so I, I said that this was the Dr. Jekyll of the history of that hotel. I'm going to call on our final student presenter tonight, Tyler Hodgkinson, to give us the, the Mr. Hyde, because where Dr. Jekyll is, Mr. Hyde is sure to be lurking. And Kyle, uh, Tyler, rather, is going to tell us a story. If you hear a rumble in the background, then I think that's Napoleon Lavely turning over in his grave. Over to you, uh, Tyler. Thank you, Peter. The Mississippi Hotel has a deep history as a refined establishment and is even today regarded as a higher end lodging option, uh, as Kyle explained. Uh, but there is a hiccup in this timeline between the late 70s and 80s, where the hotel's program had shifted to suit a rowdier crowd, eventually resulting in its downfall and temporary vacancy before its rebirth as the grand hotel we see today. My research around the hotel focuses on this period that had very little documentation around it. I saw this as an exciting challenge and an opportunity to write about something a little more scandalous than usual. For the duration of this presentation, I'll be focusing directly on the actions and events taking place under the ownership of the LeMay family that resulted in the hotel's wild era and the later ownership under Brian Carter that further escalated the situation. All was going well at the beginning of the LeMay ownership. The hotel had newly been refinished after a devastating fire and found success in hosting live musicians through the 60s and early 70s, most notably Stomping Tom Connors. Although long lasting, this would come to an end after a raid orchestrated by the Ontario Liquor Agency took place, killing the crowds and forcing LeMay to change their business strategy. The hotel began featuring rock bands. Groups such as Metagenesis and Glen Eagle performed to attract a new target demographic in an attempt to re revive the hotel's night shows. Uh, and this worked. New people came to watch and the crowds began to form again. However, these bands were much more expensive to book uh, and local competition from the Queen's Hotel down the road again forced LeMay uh, to change course and take drastic action uh, to keep the hotel afloat. This time, LeMay resorted to erotic dancers. Uh, strip shows would be featured on Friday nights along with the live music. And this was a formula that temporarily solved the hotel's financial issues. Uh, people swarmed to the hotel and it was reported that as many as 200 attendees could be seen uh, leaving after closing time. However, the solution was short-lived. The environment created was obscene. The shows had lost all sophistication with one report of a dancer smoking a cigar from her private area. This was inviting to a demographic that most people aimed to avoid. Drug use became prevalent in the building and the dense swarm of young adults prompted fights. Numerous calls were made to authorities to deal with the unruly and aggressive individuals. Uh, and these instances became more and more frequent as time went on, a difficult situation to resolve for only two police officers working at the time. The pairing of chaotic crowds with the less than classy shows also ruined the reputation of the Mississippi, causing local support to plummet while residents found themselves hating the once dearly loved hotel. The seemingly lawless nature of the hotel then caused the sale of the building to the Carter family after LeMay couldn't handle it more, admitting that the hotel had been in better shape when she bought it than, had, than it had become under her ownership. But under the new ownership, issues deepened. The Carters had tragically passed in a car accident soon after the hotel's purchase, passing uh, the ownership on to their son, Brian Carter, who may have had a lack of enthusiasm towards the idea of running his parents' hotel. The chaotic atmosphere and revived popularity was also particularly inviting to yet another demographic, that being the bikers. Raunchy shows, live music, and lawless environment 
created a favorable hangout for the crews of riders, whose presence slowly scared away almost all visitors. The bikers began to occupy the hotel. Drug use and distribution worsened, and Carter was unsuccessful for unknown reasons in his attempts to deal with them. Conversations with the former police chief who served during this period expressed the difficulties with the bikers, stating that they had been very careful not to do something that the police can investigate, but still managed to continue the trafficking of drugs within the hotel. However, from the other side, another interview brought to light that many of the attendees were good people that just enjoyed the privacy that was brought to the major that was brought after the majority of the public stopped visiting and defined the era as a time of freedom and roughhousing. The bikers enjoyed the fact that the Mississippi had been deserted, leaving them with a place to drink, watch strip shows, and hang out away from the public eye. Nonetheless, nonetheless, the bikers' occupation of the hotel eventually forced Brian Carter to give up. It shut down and went vacant for a number of years in the late 80s while he searched for potential buyers. Um, its potential destruction was discussed um, and was almost turned into a gas station. Although, although the route taken by LeMay may have caused the downfall of the Mississippi Hotel, it truly went out with a bang. The hotel during this period was loathed by the majority of the public, but it must have been one of the most lively eras the hotel ever endured. And it's that liveliness that was the main reason I was drawn to this project. Uh, thank you all for listening. And if you'd like to read more about it in depth, you can uh, see the whole story on uh, VMAO. Thanks so much for that, Tyler. That's such a, a wonderful counter story to the to the first one. And uh, I suppose if, if Heritage Ottawa had known the full content of your presentation, they probably would have wanted to schedule this uh, event for maybe 1130 at night rather than seven o'clock. But in any event, that ship has sailed. Now, I was struck too, it's, it's so extraordinary that the, the, the idea of a, a huge lawless crowd and only two police officers sounded eerily familiar. So uh, I want to now call on my colleague and friend Michael Windover with whom I co-taught the two seminars from which these presentations were all drawn to wrap us up with a few words about uh, the website itself. Over to you Michael. Thanks very much Peter um, and I'll, I'll keep these comments pretty brief. Um, probably the most satisfying part of our job uh, as professors is seeing our students um, present their research to new audiences and so it's I'm just delighted to be here tonight to bask in the reflected glory of our students. Um, as Peter noted at the outset of today's program, uh, we're going we're using the occasion of the Emerging Scholars Lecture to launch the Virtual Museum of Architecture in Ottawa project, something that Peter and I have been working on uh, for a number of years. And I'm going to show you, drum roll, what this looks like. Okay, so uh, with the uh, help of our wonderful uh, audiovisual resource center, uh, Nancy Duff, um, Adam Milling, and Bronwyn Marchant, we uh, have now got a website that you can go and visit to learn more about um, these projects. So the Virtual Museum of Architecture in Ottawa is meant to showcase and share research by undergraduate students in the History and Theory of Architecture program in the form of online exhibits. And as you've seen from the presentations today, students work with primary documents uh, about the built environment to tell the interesting stories that those uh, spaces have um, to tell us. And along the way, they also learn um, visual communication skills and a set of other, um, uh, other ways of expressing complex ideas about the designed environment. So uh, as you can see here, you can see a little bit of a, um, a description of the virtual museum in general. And uh, then if you want to know more about the Carlton Place exhibits that you've seen just uh, or had a little taster from the students today, um, you just scroll on down here and you can see a series of projects that the students over the last two years um, have put together. Now, what we have here are highlighted a, a few of the projects that our seminar um, over the last two years uh, produced. 
I must say that um, it was just wonderful working with these students and um, to recognize that while the students produced these individual projects, there really was a strong sense of camaraderie, peer review and peer support, um, which helped to make these things the success that they are. Also, we would be nowhere uh, without the support of Jennifer Irwin and um, her heroic efforts in digitizing these materials so that the students had access um, to them and, and were able to, to create these evocative narratives. Um, and so we were just um, delighted to partner with the uh, Carlson Place and, and Beckwith Heritage uh, Museum for this project at a very challenging time with COVID. So even though students in the first year couldn't actually get to Carlton Place to see the buildings, they were able to experience them at least partially through those primary documents. So as you can see here, you can click on these and learn a little bit more about the stories um, that you got a little taste of tonight. And so without further ado, I will turn things uh, over uh, to Anne to moderate the discussion. So. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Peter and Michael and uh, Jennifer and uh, the rest of the team, the students for this fantastic presentation. And I have to say that it's one of the most seductive titles for um, a lecture that I've heard in this series and it certainly didn't disappoint. I think the idea of this virtual museum is so great and it sounds like one of the happy projects that have resulted from our, our, our terrible COVID times. And I'm really anxious to go online and, and to check out the rest of the stories. Uh, I really resonated with one of uh, Peter's comments about the fact that the history of, um, of a building is an organic and fluid thing and that there are many chapters uh, that can be explored and that's where we're so lucky to have a resource uh, like the museum and a, a wonderful collaborative um, curator like, uh, like um, Jennifer. So I would like uh, to um, invite the audience at this point to post some questions for any of our speakers. And you may do so in the official language of your choice. There's a Q&A uh, function button at the bottom of your screens, if you could please use that. And I will moderate the questions and the, and the, um, and the comments for uh, repetition and length. So let me see, we do have a few questions, but I'd like to start with um, a couple of my own, if you'll, um, if you'll just uh, bear with me. Um, and it's going back to, uh, I'd like to ask Jennifer about uh, her experience with being able to dig into the archives to be able to digitize some of these um, really important documents in order for this project to happen. And also thinking about um, whether or not you have any other artifacts in your collection that come from some of these places that we've just learned about and if there if there was an effort to um, to save uh, furnishings or objects from any of these buildings um certain buildings had more things than others of course the mississippi hotel um, in terms of artifacts we're really lucky to have some of their original china i had their own china produced with a nice logo on it um, if you go into the students exhibit, you'll see photos of those, as well as the original register that was at the front desk. And uh, <clears throat> it had a bell, so you could ring for help. It had a neat little thing to strike a match on because everybody was smoking at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and it even had little tin engraved advertisements for stores and services in town. So if you're visiting town, you'd know where to go. Um, that that's jumps to mind as the one with the most physical artifacts. Um, for me, the most interesting in terms of scanning documents was the Waterworks building, um, which we didn't talk about tonight. But it's a recently, um, the building has just recently been added to our list of culturally significant properties. And we were able to find the original blueprints and plans for the boilers and things like that. So it was a really fun exercise for me to go digging myself 
um, to help the students. So yeah, it was great. <laughs> And have, have the students had a chance to come in and physically check out some of the documents yet, or everything's been really done digitally? Uh, the last group did come for a, a very short tour of town, but we were limited in time and, and no, we need to do that with the next group. Oh, that's, that's so cool. And yeah. thank you for your collaboration. It's just fantastic. I can't wait to come and visit yes, after you might. I look at the website. Yes, and I certainly will. Thank you. Okay, we have a few questions here from the audience. Um, a question from Martin Freeman asking, how was the hotel eventually saved? And I guess we can ask um, uh, Kyle or Tyler to speak to that. Um, I can answer, uh, well, at least to my knowledge, if Kyle would like to add on after and invite him to. Um, it's been a while since I was doing my research, but if I recall correctly, there was a uh, local movement by uh, a woman, I cannot recall her name, but <laughs> when uh, discussion was going around about the hotel being demolished and potentially being sold to make a gas station, uh, they were trying to save it as it was a significant piece of uh, Carlton Place's history. And uh, there's a big movement to bring it back. And uh, Stomp and Tom Connors was actually contacted about it as he was a very prevalent person um, in the hotel's history. And it actually mentions that in Tom Connors' uh, bibliography, or biography, the book there. So he was involved and there's this big movement to get it back up. And I'm not ex exactly sure how it ended up being a hotel again, um, but it was purchased and renovated into the Grand Hotel we see today. I, I can add a little bit to that. Um, I know that the com that uh, the hotel was um, it was purchased by some sort of commercially operating company, and because the hotel is situated where it is in the dead center of town, because it was you know it's been there forever, um, and also on such an important on an important avenue of the town as well, um, the company was interested in it um, for the commercial value of the lot rather than the hotel itself. And so, yeah, they were, they had plans to tear it down, um, but the people that got involved, I don't have any specific names, but it's the local architectural conservation advisory committee. And they came in and did an assessment and they had some people come in and advise. And um, yeah, so they kind of uh, with their clout and um, the, the words of other people that were involved, um, they managed to, yeah, to curb the, the demolition. Um, and then the hotel, it was going to, there was some talk of it becoming several things, if I remember correctly, but it was ultimately decided that it was just, I think it was just best suited to being a hotel because that's what it was built as. Um, yeah, so that's all the information I have on the, on the saving of it. Well, that's great. Thanks. Uh, I guess another question for Jennifer, are newspapers digitized at the museum? Um, our our local library actually had most of our local newspapers on microfiche at the beginning of this project. Um, we'd been trying together to get them scanned into a searchable um, you know, database. <clears throat> so because of this project, we were able to get a little bit of funding and we did do the newspapers up to 1930. Mm -hmm. um, but since the beginning of this project, we've actually come, uh, we've had several hundred, maybe thousand um, original newspapers donated to the museum's collection. Wow. So we need to go back in and, and fill in the gaps um, and then do 1930 to uh, the present. So we are, that's an ongoing project um, and we need to make it searchable because as we know, that's the best resource there is out there as uh, local newspapers. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I guess a, a question also related to this, are there more images accompanying the talks in the virtual museum than there were in tonight's presentations? So you yeah, truncated what, what you have on, the exhibit that you have online has obviously a lot more information, I would think and more visuals. 
Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think all of the projects have a ton more, a ton of more imagery. We just chose what was the best for the stuff we chose to talk about tonight. Right. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. The photographs were just so fascinating. Wonderful. Uh, another question, which probably has to do with the hotel in, in a general way, was China produced in Ontario? So we talked about the, ch the special China that was um, uh, made for the hotel. Would that have been fabricated in, in Ontario or would it, that have been coming from somewhere else? Uh, the Mississippi Hotel China that we have does not have a maker's mark on the bottom. But we do have um, quite a bit of souvenir type China featuring local buildings. Um, and a lot of that was made in Austria. Interesting. So I believe that you could, as a, a shop owner or a, a building owner, you could order from Austria things with your logo put on them. Um, so I actually, I don't know the answer to that question. I know we have some from Austria. And we, we don't know for sure the origin of the Mississippi Hotel plates. Sounds like that could be another interesting project. That's right. I think, to see how many people could, I'm imagining it wouldn't have been um, cheap to have something like that done. It would be a, a rather um, sophisticated, elite thing to do for yourself, as families might have done too. Uh, a question, and this probably might relate to. Um, to Ashley and the wonderful photographs that you showed of the parks full of people there to celebrate the arrival of um, the Duke and Ju Duchess. Were there many parks in the 1900s at Carleton Place? So I'm not sure about the parks, but actually what's interesting about that photo that I showed with all of the gathering is that behind and on the side of where that photo from where that photographer was is actually building. And so it was just, that's just how many people were gathered in front of the roundhouse. So the roundhouse and Carlton Junction were actually very close together naturally because the train had to be serviced in the roundhouse. But uh, yeah, I don't know about the parks, but it was just, everyone was just filled like into that spot. So it wasn't the park, it was really where the train station was. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I could uh, just jump in a little bit too, just to say that yeah. one of the other um, uh, exhibitions that is available deals with the um, the waterworks and part of uh, what the student was doing was situating the waterworks within um, a kind of cultural landscape that includes parkscape. So if you're interested in parks, there's a little bit uh, in, the, in that presentation. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, here's a, a, a comment perhaps. Uh, Karen Pritchula writes to say at least one Heritage Ottawa member attended the Mississippi Hotel in the late 70s, not for the strippers and drugs, of course, but for the good band. I actually remember seeing strippers hanging out the upper windows of the place. <laughs> it's a grand place today. Jennifer, Peter, and the students put on an informative lecture tonight, and thank you. That's really cool. Does uh, Carlton, Martin Rice ask, does Carlton Place hold a doors open event? Yes, we do. We try to do it every two years. Um, we are planning a doors open event for September of 2023. Good to know. Thank yeah. you. Uh, we have a query. What is the Carlton Museum website? Uh, Maybe Jennifer, or um, if Jen is still with us, you could put that up in the comments or somewhere where everyone can see it. I'm not sure how we can do that. Unless it's really easy and uh, Jennifer can rhyme it off. Jen has put it in the chat, at least it's showing up in my chat. I don't know if it's Perfect. showing up to non-panelists chat or not. Maybe someone who's non-panelist as in an audience member can confirm that it's showing up in their chat as well. But, but okay. I'm seeing it there. Good, okay. I, I'm not seeing it yet, but I'm kind of all over the place here. Okay, oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what else have we got here? When was the restaurant addition added to the end of the, the hotel, the building? Do we know what year that happened? I think that was after the period I covered. I don't know if Tyler okay. knows. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't fully go into research about uh, physical alterations to the building. I I 
surrounded more of uh, the program, what was going on in the building. So unfortunately, I can't, I can't give an exact date on that. Okay, thanks. I can probably jump well, in. Sorry. Okay. Um, I actually think I can answer this question. If by the restaurant they're referring to the uh, the building that sits um, on an angle, uh, there's a, it sits at an intersection and um, at an, in okay. kind of an L shape. There's an addition to it. If that's the building they're talking about, um, I can't recall the date off the top of my head, but that was one of the uh, the Mekilquam additions um, in the early 1900s or late 1800s. That building was actually built as um, a showroom for local salesmen, um, and it was a it was kind of a, a revolving setup. Um, traveling salesmen could come and set up the main floor and stay on the top floor, and they could um, show off their wares, kind of like a tiny mall before malls had been invented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, locals would come and and shop there and peruse there. It didn't become a restaurant until until much later. Um, I believe it's a it's a bar now, and I think there's like. A, like a patio area to sit outside. But yeah, if that's the building they're talking about, then I, I can at least offer that. <laughs> okay, that's really cool. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Lots of um, great comments to thank everyone and lots of people intending to head over to the website. Uh, are there stories, Jason Kondrink asks, are there stories from the hotel and Finley House of lavish parties and or other famous guests who may have visited. So I don't know if um, I can uh, might know. Yeah. <laughs> I can speak on the Findlay House. Um, I didn't come across anything about specific lavish parties, um, but I think from the image that uh, if you remember uh, the Christmas party image of the Findleys um, that I showed, uh, I can't confirm whether that was taken, uh, at 207 High Street, it could have been a, it might have been another home of a Findlay uh, in Carlton Place. Um, but I think from their attire um, and just, uh, you know, the spaces in the home, um, there was dedicated uh, like hosting spaces and um, uh, extra rooms like the billiards room and stuff. Uh, so they definitely had the resources to have some pretty nice parties, uh, I think, uh, but no specific stories that I can say right now. <laughs> And I have a, a sort of a, a related question in terms of my fascination with Jean Isabel playing uh, billiards. And I wondered if, uh, if you were able to delve into any research about her background and whether she got involved with the family business. I couldn't find anything about that. Um, there's some more interesting photos of her growing up in the home. Um, she stayed there until her death. Um, obviously, she raised her children there. Um, but there's nothing specifically about her being involved in the family business. Um, while I didn't include it in my in my project, I did come across a lot about um, George being really involved in the community beyond um, Findlay's Limited. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that uh, she was probably involved with him at a lot of social events um, and charitable causes uh, that I think he was involved in. So, yeah. <laughs> no, that's cool. Thank you. Okay, okay. what else do we have here? Um, oh, someone comments that the Christmas picture uh, is similar to Downton Abbey. <laughs> uh, can uh, Catherine? Spencer Ross asks, can one still see remnants of the railway function in the current configuration of the building that was the roundhouse? Yeah, so if you go inside um, of the engineering shop, so the roundhouse now they've sort of taken it over and it's like a, it's a, a it's just a store, but if you're inside the storage area, you can still see the tracks going all the way through that mm -hmm. building. Um, and then coming out a little bit, but they seem to have paved over it on the side. So in front of the modern picture that I showed, there are still the railway tracks that are there. And now there's mm -hmm. actually a park that like has like play structures that look like railway <laughs> infrastructure, oh, which is nice. kind of fun. Yeah. Um, but now it's it's pretty much grass. And I think the I remember Jennifer did a, a drive by video of everything to show us. And I, I'm pretty sure that there's a Tim Hortons there that was where I assumed where Carlton Junction used to be. So there are like little snippets and 
things, yeah, maybe Jennifer can shed some more light on it, but there are areas where you can go in and see that, you know, there are some remnants over there. I was actually able to go because I live in Ottawa, so I just took a day trip just to go see it myself, so yeah. Good. Jennifer, did you want to say more? Yeah, I just wanted to add, you can see that set of rail tracks going into the, the grading station, um, but most of the iron tracks were torn out in World War II um, and sold as scrap for the war effort. Mm. But a lot of the neat artifacts were left in the building when the cooperative wool growers purchased it. And the owner now, or the manager now, is a real train fanatic. Um, and he's actually created a little mini train museum in the building, um, in the Western Ware room. And so it's got, it's an amazing collection. I'm very jealous of it. So all uh, CPR, CN, things he found in the building, but he's been adding to it over the years as well. So mm -hmm. it's definitely worth a look. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have time for just a few more questions. And um, Bruce Elliott uh, says that he toured some of the hotel, some of the hotel a few years ago, which is very nicely restored and worth seeing, and a great student project. Were there any resident architects or buildings in Carlton Place whose papers have survived? Again, maybe I don't know, Peter, Jennifer. That, uh, I, I don't know. I don't recall any of that. Maybe uh, some of the students do just thinking of the various things we looked at in class and the huge piles of documents we went through. I don't have any recollection of any Carlton Place architects surfacing in all that, but you know, Jennifer may know better or the students may remember something I've forgotten or Michael may remember something I've forgotten. Uh, um, I don't know. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, no, no, you go. I, I was just going to say that I one one uh, student project looking at the library that had some had some uh, blueprints and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I can't remember coming across other sort of direct, you know, kind of architectural kind of uh, fall or anything like that. Um, no, we we do know a little bit about a builder, William Willoughby. He he constructed. Um, the museum building, the Mississippi Hotel. Um, he certainly wasn't an architect, but I don't even know if they would have used an architect if he just knew the styles. So, right. But uh, no, the answer is no. Yeah, Ashley, did you want to? Yeah. yeah, I know for like the roundhouse, I, I don't know if by papers you mean like actual architectural drawings, but for the roundhouse, I was able yeah. to find some and they are posted um, in my in the exhibit for the Carlton Place roundhouse and they didn't come from a Carlton Place architect but they came from like the railway company had like sets of drawings that they were just giving already made so there is that on the, the museum exhibit too if you're interested great thank you I can I... speak to um, floor plans as well uh, mm -hmm. only floor plans I don't know about any um, extra documents um, but I know that the hotel is in possession of at least some floor plans, which I think are from some of the, the middling renovations or probably not the earliest renovations, but um, I've seen them framed on the walls in the backgrounds of, of some of the photos from the interiors. I've never actually seen the blueprints myself, but I know that they're, they're around somewhere. Whether that was a local architect or not, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. I think we have one more comment and it, it's I think a fitting one to end our session tonight. And it comes from Stefan Roy, who asks, does the Carlton Place and Beckwith Museum have a collection of concert posters? Was the Mississippi Hotel the only musical venue? But the real question is, whatever happened to Metagenesis? <laughs> so over to you, Jennifer. I wish we had a collection of concert posters. Um, we do have quite a few more recent, so 1980s to now, um, concerts that were held, some at the Mississippi, the Queens Hotel was another venue for live music. Um, our current town hall has a lovely auditorium and that's where most of the uh, more cultured performances, shall we say, happen. <laughs> um, we, we don't have a lot of posters, that's making me think. We have a lot of programs. Um, so, which are actually more valuable because they list all the different performers and who the stage manager was and that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to have to start a little campaign to ask for 
posters. So. Of, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I think that would be really fun. Yes, thank you. Okay, I, Genesis. Well, yeah. I, I, about Metagenesis, when I was doing my research, it was, it was kind of hard to find some stuff, but um, I believe it was the drummer had actually just like recently passed away, I believe in 2020. So that is, that's all I could find on them. But they were also known as uh, the Murray Reed group, I believe. And yeah, I, aside from like a few Facebook posts, I wasn't able to find a whole lot other than uh, the news clip stating the one member's uh, passing. Interesting. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So I think that uh, this brings this fantastic session to a close. And I hope everyone in our audience has enjoyed it as much as I have. And I can see, as I've said, uh, trip out to Carlton Place in my near future, maybe this weekend, yeah. So I'd like to thank everybody once again, the professors and uh, Jennifer and all the students uh, for their presentation. And with that, good night and thank you all for joining us.